Welcome to What's the Risk, hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can use to better understand index and portfolio performance, along with addressing some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on the Bloomberg Osbond Bank Bill Index, essentially up to 90-day bank bills, or you might know it just as cash. An ETF out there that is similar to this is uh, BlackRock's BILL, which is based on the S&P ASX Bank Bill Index. The res- returns are exactly the same on the Bloomberg and the S&P. So if you're interested in short-term cash-like index, that would be somewhat representative of what we're discussing. Well, people might think this might be a bit of a boring one, being bank bills of cash, but there are some things worth knowing and understanding. So your investment philosophy, a book we wrote, uh, available at Amazon if you'd like to pick it up. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say, our intent is educational and not rendering financial advice. These are simple concepts. We'd like investors better to understand performance in the short and long term. So the periodic performance, long term looks okay, I guess. Intermediate to medium term, not real good. And as of late, cash has been a little bit more tempting. But that's the reason that I've included monthly CPI down at the bottom. Because if you factor in tax, you're really getting beaten up if you're using cash as some sort of long term investment vehicle. Absolutely. When you uh, look at the uh, returns, particularly if we start from the sort of 40-year mark uh, and and come forward, those returns, of course, are fully taxable. So depending on your marginal tax rate, the returns could be nearly half of that if you're at the top tax rate. And by the time you take off inflation at every turn from one year right back to 40 years, it's almost a certainty that if you invest in cash and you have to pay any tax, you'll actually have gone backwards in terms of your purchasing power. With the data going back to 1977, from 77 through to 1990 was a period of very high inflation and a period of very high short-term interest rates. That 13 years has a major influence on the 40-year and the since inception numbers. And if you then look from 30 years coming forward to now, apart from the very low interest rates in recent times, which influenced the sort of three and five and 10 year numbers, the numbers are very similar around the three to 4% mark. I know that having seen some very long-term data, the return on cash going back to Federation, which is 123 years, is somewhere circa 4% per annum. And when we say what's the risk, cash, you can see what the risk is right there. Absolutely. The risk is that the purchasing power of your money after tax goes backwards. Risk was once described to me in a conversation with Professor Ken French as the inability to undertake the spending you want to undertake at some future date. If you want to spend the money that you've got in cash, but it's losing value, then your ability to undertake that spending is gradually being eroded away from you. It's being stolen from you. The growth of wealth. At first glance, this looks pretty good. And that was my reaction when I had to first did the chart. A dollar to 28.73 over 47 years. I thought, oh, that's not too bad. And then I wondered if I had it wrong or right. And then I pulled up the MSCI world over the same period. For comparison, it was $117. Uh, so the cash return, it's a pretty smooth graph. Yes, there's the flat patch towards the right-hand end of the chart, but it's a nice smooth ride. And because it's smooth, because it's less risky, it delivers a quarter of the return of investing in shares. And of course, over that same period, shares were quite volatile. You had the 1987 stock market crash, you had the first Gulf War, you had the tech wreck, you had the second Gulf War and September 11, you had the global financial crisis, you had COVID. Shares certainly had their volatile times over that time, but you got $4 back from the share market for every $1 you got from investing in cash. And that's before we think about the impact of tax. And range of returns. This looks a little bit different to some of the equity ranges of returns, and you don't see a negative, which it's a different type of risk. It's the risk of running out of money, not losing it. So if you're looking to spend from these types of returns, eventually you're probably going to be eating your capital. Yeah, look, most investors fear not being able to spend what they need to spend to enjoy the lifestyle they want to have. But the irony of it is what they tend to react to is the value of their assets falling over short periods of time that they can visibly see. Unfortunately, investing in cash rather than a significant immediate downturn, it's just a gradual nibbling away at your purchasing power and eventually you lose the ability to spend 
the way you'd like. I remember someone said to me one time that he knew uh, a person knew someone who was looking to retire around that one year best return mark. And they thought, oh, this is fantastic. I'm going to get 20% returns. Yeah. And we're going to plan my retirement on this. And it quickly fell away over the next few years. You were assuming like a 19% return. And then it was down to, you'd be able to say exactly what it was per probably, but it was it was down to probably six or something within a couple of years. I, I can recall instances many years ago, back around 1990, that if someone retired with $300,000, which today would not be considered a large superannuation pot at all, but at a 19% return, that's $57,000 a year, and that's in $1990. That would have felt great. But within only sort of six to seven years, that same $300,000 was only generating $18,000 a year. And $18,000 did not buy nearly as much as fifty seven. dollars And when you inflation adjusted it, it was even worse. A rolling annual returns, and we see these these peaks in the 80s. I guess it uh, tells a story. Sure, there's been some high rates, but if you're one of the other things towards the right of the chart, if you were sitting in cash, indulging some of those prophets of doom who told you the end has been nigh every year, of which there were mm. very many, while equities just continued to go up, you probably wrecked. I mean, there's no chance you can catch up to what you've, from the lies that you've probably bought into that the world was ending and you needed to leave your money in no, cash. You absolutely can't. It's a classic case of the horse had already bolted. So shutting the gate at that point was of little value. If you decided to adopt a cash position and liquidate all of your equities because the world was coming to an end, you've not only not received the gains that the equity markets delivered, albeit with the volatility that they bring to the table anyway. But you're stuck with ever declining returns until just the last few months. Not only did you miss out on what you could have had, but what you chose to invest in just got worse and worse and worse. Uh, historic chances of a positive negative return. Could you have a negative return? Yes, there are actually three negative months and one uh, negative quarter that just appeared um, in the index data. They're all pandemic related as you'd, as you'd expect. And look, if you look outside Australia and you look at global markets as an example, there were periods in during the global financial crisis and at other times, you know, in the ensuing years where you actually got charged to put your money in a bank. So there is such a thing as a negative interest rate that can occur with cash. Yes, you can get a negative rate of return. It's going to be extremely rare. To me, the reason we hold cash is for relatively imminent spending. And that's Cert the only good reason for holding. Yeah, certainly if you short-term spend. Exactly. Uh, so this largest fall uh, is a, a little bit silly. Uh, like I said, this did pop up in the index data. I did try to replicate it actually because State Street has an Australian cash uh, trust to see if this actually happened. I, I couldn't. The, like the movements were so, like it was the third, the third number past a decimal point yeah. where it was showing up. So, I mean, it's just there for a bit, of, a bit of a laugh, really, just to see it did go negative. But absolutely, you've chosen a very, very uh, narrow scale to make the chart appear like anything. Yeah, you know, and and if the the vertical scale were at all realistic, it would appear as basically a flat line. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Cash, look, the chances of you losing money with cash are pretty close to zero. They're not zero, but they're pretty darn close to zero. But the flip side of that is the returns just won't sustain you in the long run. And risk return. So it's obviously the least there. And I get uh, this brings up the question, why does someone use a cash product instead of cash in a high interest savings account? I've sort of read some various explanations. None I felt were greatly convincing. We don't sort of have that same money market culture that they have in the US. You know, I don't believe that I've ever heard a, a truly credible and reliable explanation. I, I think that in the US it's and, and to an extent in Europe, it's probably a cultural thing. You know, whereas you know, here in Australia, Aussies are just as happy negotiating with their own bank, and maybe using 30, 60, 90 day term deposits to roll over from time to time for the, the spending that's coming up. In reality, whether you're using a bank bill index ETF or a bank bill index managed fund or whether you're going to your local bank and, and utilising their sort of short term savings 
or, or, or term deposit products, the result's going to be very much the same. And I think it's just up to the individual investor as to what they're happy using. I would have no great reservations about substituting one for the other. And sources and descriptions of data. So thanks for joining us for this one. We'll see you again next time. Bye for now.